Hello, I'm Simit Bose, founder of Future Net Zero. We are a website that produces content to help you cut your carbon footprint. And the Net Hero podcast is all about that, highlighting people doing amazing things to cut emissions. Be that scientists, business people, inventors, or just common, ordinary people who are doing something to make a change. If you want to get involved, then email us. And we're looking for a sponsor for this amazing podcast. So if you'd like to know more, get in touch. On to this week's episode. Hello, welcome to this unusual episode of the Net Hero podcast. Not just because I've got a bit of a beard, but uh, there isn't a specific guest this week. But it's quite a relevant week for me to talk about our ambitions around the world. It's COP, COP29. Now, if you recall, in fact, we started the Net Hero podcast way back when it was COP, I think it was 26, back in uh, Glasgow. And I'm not sure whether the COP has run its time. Let's look at what's happening this year. It's in Azerbaijan, in Baku, which is, of course, a country that uses a shed load of oil and gas. In fact, it's got so much, it's <laughs> it's drowning in the stuff. The appointment of the representative from Azerbaijan, um, who was someone that worked for their car, oil and gas company, hasn't gone down too well, which I'm not surprised at. And there's been some controversies that um, that he's been talking about how with sort of fake journalists, how um, there could be more opportunities for extracting oil and gas. Now, that's not a good look for <laughs> hosting a climate change conference. Now, but I'm not going to massively criticise the people of Azerbaijan, and the same as the UAE, because the other flip side of this is that you need these petro states, if you want to call them, to be on board because you can't just be a transition for the rich. But let's have a look at what is planned. Before I go through my issues with COP, let's look at what it's trying to get round this time round. So it's trying to arrange a few things. The first thing is um, what they call NDCs, uh, National Climate Commitments, i.e. I will do this and I promise to do this. So countries are expected to make more targets uh, this time round building on kind of um, commitments to stop fossil fuels, improve energy efficiency, integrate adaptation, all of that. Um, and the idea is they all contribute to this 1.5 degrees limit. They've also got something called a financial and global goal on adaptation. They love their acronyms called the GGA. And this is basically funding, funding for poorer nations. Finding a way to fill the gap in funding, partly, uh, and to make sure that there's some uh, balance to how you do this, whether you're using mitigation tactics or you're trying to create stuff and looking at the vulnerabilities, particularly things like flood defences or things like that. There's also a loss and damage funding discussion going on, which is uh, happened at the, the last COP, a fund for responding to loss and damage, which is saying, Develop nations, give us more money. This helps developing nations uh, manage climate impacts that exceed their sort of limits, things like rising sea levels, big storms, all of that. The one that, <laughs> well, I mean, if this happens, I'll be amazed. But the one that's been going on for ages is all about the creation of carbon markets. They call it Article 6. And COP's looking at mechanisms to create a carbon trading market. Now, I've had... Um, Thoughts of this for many years. For me, you will never get to where we really want to get to until you put a price on carbon. And it's got to be a commodity. The way that we price a barrel of oil or anything like that, or a megawatt of electricity, you've got to have a price for this stuff. And this has been the problem because no one can agree what a ton of carbon is, or if that's the measure. No one can agree how it would be traded, where it would be traded. Would there be multiple exchanges around the world? And this discussion, in my view, is just going to go around the houses one more time. I can't see it coming together. Unless you have a real global determination to say, 
this is what we're going to do. We all agree it will be traded at this sort of level. This is the parameters. And these could be the three or four financial centers that govern it. But would Russia want to be involved? Who knows? It's a pariah right now, but you never know what's going to happen. China? Yeah. India? Should this stock exchange for carbon be in, in London or on New York? What's to stop it being in, in Manila? There's so many questions to be answered. So I think that one is a long, long way to go on that. Uh, they're looking at fossil fuel subsidies. So uh, debating the um, ending of that. Again, I don't think globally speaking, that's a real goer. I just think there are too many nations that, you know, are using fossil fuels, whether you like it or not, because they're trying to bring their populations up into a standard of living that we've got used to in the West. And why shouldn't they? So I think, again, this, this will be a difficult one. The last two major talking points that they're, they're having a chat about this week are the climate finance goals um, and just transition. Now, <sighs> I agree with the term just transition, you need one, but how will it come to be? I have no idea. Is it just that you ask India or Brazil or Russia or China to cut their emissions and go pay for much more expensive energy infrastructure when they're nowhere near what we've been doing for the last 150 years? Is it fair that we in the UK, particularly with Labour's uh, push, put in many more regulations and our energy already costs pretty much the most uh, in Europe, you know, we'll be paying more as consumers. And yet we contribute what? Less, less than 5% to global emissions, it's probably even less than that. These are all things that are questions that are so difficult to answer. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, aiming for a just transition isn't the right thing. But the problem is a just transition means very different things in different parts of the world. All of this is based on the latest reports, which are, you've probably seen them, they've been covered on Future Net Zero and Energy Life News. Uh, the climate change uh, governing body in, is looking at not trying to get limited to 1.5 or 2, it's saying it could be 3, 3 degrees by the end of this century, if we carry on where we are. The second part of all of this is, and I, I, that is a doom and gloom scenario, which I, I personally don't agree with. I think you, you can't keep telling people it's all disastrous. They'll see it because they've seen the weather events, but I, I would not be able to quantify what 3.1 degree rise will be in 2099, right, sitting here in 2024, and I don't think anyone can. So I see why scientists do this, but will this add to the thing we need to do, which is to change people's attitudes and change the, the pathway of emissions, uh, reductions to make that faster? I'm not too sure. The other point about why I think COP is in trouble is that lots of major nations are not there. They've just not bothered turning up. So let's take Europe. Ursula von der Leyen, you know, who runs the EU, she's not coming. She's not turning up. Um, President Xi of China's not coming. You've got um, uh, Lula, the president of Brazil's not there. Modi, uh, the president of India's not there. Obviously, Donald Trump's not there because he's not in power yet. And even though the Biden administration have got representative there, Joe Biden's not there. And think about this, Joe Biden, you know, he gave a speech just the other day outside the White House saying, you know, one of the things he said about his legacy was that a lot of the changes they've done to try and improve the climate will, will be felt. But he's not turning up in his last role as president, major role internationally. And that kind of gives a signal that really he's kind of given up the ghost. Um, other economies like Australia and Mexico have not listed their leaders as well. And so you've got a few um, people from Europe, such as obviously you've got Macron is there and you've got Starmer there and you've got a lot of de developing nations. But unless we get the major people coming together, I don't know how effective the discussions from this COP will be. The Azerbaijan thing, which I mentioned right at the beginning, Azerbaijan's got issues around human rights. We all know that. 
It's got the oil and gas. It has uh, a man called Makhtar Babaev as the president, who was a former executive at the oil state company Soka. So a lot of uh, green groups particularly are thinking this is just pointless, right? And they have a building there called the Flame, which is quite interesting. It's like fantastic looking skyscraper in the shape of a, a flame because of gas. Um, does this all matter? Well, look, let's look at what COP has achieved. It's been growing now for nearly three decades, right? Um, and it's done some good things. 97, the, the Kyoto Protocol, uh, the Paris Agreement in 2015, you know, it's had the ability to get people talking. And we are in a lot better place than we were in the mid 90s. Flipping neck, a lot better. But there's criticism, which I think, having been to one cop, I could see it and I can, I can see it now. It's so slow. The implementation of the things that are agreed, you do it, then you hold another cop the next year and nothing's been done. So either you space these cops out, in my view, or we actually get on and do these things. And it's all very well to make pledges. We've seen that so many times. But how many things are done? People say that there is a real lethargy amongst rich nations who commit, but then don't cough up. And often there's just no action. Fossil fuel dependence. Uh, critics argue that um, it hasn't addressed it. Well, <laughs> as I said earlier, how can you when you've got nations, you've got to bring everyone on it. And there are countries out there who will say, we'll still use fossil fuels till we get ourselves up to it. We may put in other technologies. We might do carbon capture at the same time, but we've got these resources. We cannot afford to build lots of renewables, cannot afford to go and create lots of nuclear. So we're going to use these. So that is the real issue that you've got states that you have to bring on board who need to be part of the transition, who are oil and gas states. So do you just say you don't have them? That's just lunacy. But then isn't that a complete, you know, hypocrisy, uh, as the green groups would say, because you've got them there. It's a really tricky one because I can't believe that you can get to where we want to be without these big nations, oil and gas nations transitioning. So in that one, I think it'll have to continue. Insensitivity. This has been a lot of criticism about this and fairness. You know, developing countries are often at the front line of what happens in climate change, but they lack the resources to have representation. So you go to these meetings and I remember when we were in, in Glasgow um, and they were saying, oh, there's a big meeting going on there. And it's the US and it was, you know, who else it was there, the UK and Saudi Arabia and whatever. And then places like Vanuatu and other small nations, the Solomon Islands, they were like kicked to a little side room near the toilet where not much was going on. And yet these are the people that will be facing some of the biggest challenges. So there's a, a problem with COP, how it's negotiated. It becomes uh, the irony of COP is nearly every time, which does make me laugh. Everyone just bloody flies there. <laughs> so you've got people from diplomats flying around the world, going to a place, spending thousands in money, got hundreds of thousands in resources to host these things. There's the food, there's the drink, there's the water, there's the air conditioning, all of these things. For a bunch of people to, in suits to sit down and talk about saving the planet, the optics, as they say in America, the optics don't look good. And mixed outcomes. Some would say that COP's been a failure, all of them, because frankly, you haven't got anywhere. Others would say, that it has been pushing and pushing in a way that has made um, a lot of a lot of changes. But the problem is the global scale of this. Now, if each nation did a COP and you said, right, we're going to get everyone together in our nation and we work out our best strategy for ourselves, I could see there's there's some value in that. But who can afford to do that if you're a smaller nation? COP as it is. What will it do? You have Trump about to come in in January, who will probably likely do what he did back uh, the first time round 
and take the US uh, out of the Paris Agreement. Now, if he does that, I think you're going to have a lot of trouble trying to convince China and India and Russia and Brazil to meet their targets because they'll say, well, hang on, he's not doing it. Why is Trump doing it? He's doing it for energy security. He knows that if he can get the prices down by having, as he calls it, the uh, re renaissance of oil and gas, which is completely bonkers in my view. But anyway, the drill baby drill line, people know what he's doing, but they're willing to accept the fact that the economics of it will probably benefit them. So you've got this real fundamental issue here. Economically, we haven't got the drivers to say, stop doing oil and gas. We all know there's not one person that's going to, to cop, not one nation on this planet that doesn't work out that this stuff is crap and it isn't good for us. But that doesn't mean they're going to get rid of it. So do we look at something else? Do we look at for COP to survive? Do we look at the promotion of funding for carbon capture? I think most nations will agree the future is lower, if not no emissions. Everyone would want that. No, there's not one country that doesn't want cleaner air. We know we can do that if we have more nuclear. Of course, renewable and solar. Battery storage technologies, yes. But the oil and gas, if you look at it, everyone say, the scientists would say, the pressure groups would say, stop it, just stop it today. But that is not going to happen globally. So you have got to make a balanced decision here, which is for the longer term, is it worth a bit of short term pain? which is you allow nations who are using oil and gas, they're going to use it anyway, but you say to them, right, you have got to put in carbon capture methods and we develop that technology so that we can start to reduce the worst impacts of this. We look at moving nations not straight onto electric vehicles, which is really difficult and very expensive. We say, right, let us move everyone onto hybrid technology to begin with. Even though that's not as, as good, you are reducing the emissions. And you do the electrification in things that nations can control, for example, their bus networks or, you know, the public transport sectors, taxis, things like that. You mandate those things to be that. You look at developing more nuclear and you try and help that because whatever the you know, opponents of nuclear say, it is a massive way of getting huge baseload and really... I don't think anyone's really done the maths on the carbon footprint of 10,000, 20,000 wind turbines over 60 years compared to building a small modular reactor, three or four of those that will last you 60 or 80 years. It's all of this stuff is really difficult to quantify unless people do the science. And I'd encourage anyone who's watching who's thinking about it, that'd be great. Give me a study that shows me the efficacy in terms of carbon footprint, embedded carbon for those sort of technologies. So where does that leave us? Well, um, Keir Starmer is going to make some pledges later this week about kind of, you know, Britain at the forefront, leading away. And um, that's all great. But at the end of the day, this is the conference of the parties of, of nations around the world. And those nations have all got contrasting pressures. They've all got contrasting views on how to do this. Um, for me, I think, I, I fear that COP is a bit of a busted flush. Is number 29. How many more we have? 35, 45, 50, COP 90. Will we just keep talking? We need action. And in summary, I think the nations of the world need to be shown that they can do their pathway to emissions reductions but they need help from the richer nations to give them the tools to do that. And in some cases, that will be building renewables. In some cases, that will be building carbon capture while they transition. So that's my take. I'm not, I'm not enamoured by it. I don't think it'll achieve much. I think 
Um, the one thing I loved about COP when I went in Glasgow was I got to meet, and I think that is very valid. You get to meet people from around the world, met people from so many developing nations. It was brilliant to speak to them. There were people there doing kind of unusual things. And I think that is really great. And any human um, kind of uh, dialogue, particularly in the world we live in where everyone's kind of polarised, that is a great thing. Whether we get the achievements out of this COP compared to all the others, I'm not too sure. That's my take on it. You let me know what you think. Remember, you can be on the Net Hero podcast. Just give us a, an email, drop us a line on nethero at futurenetzero.com. Remember to watch us and subscribe to us on your usual podcast channel or on YouTube. And keep contributing to the stories that help us understand. Hope you've enjoyed uh, watching this. My thanks to Rob for the production. And I'll catch you next time. You've just heard the Net Hero podcast from futurenetzero.com. Join us as we help you find ways to cut your carbon footprint as we head towards net zero. Subscribe and follow us on social media. futurenetzero.com. Better business, better planet.